Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Eva Nolik Smith with Yoga You Online, and I am super excited to welcome you today to this talk on new discoveries in our understanding of flexibility and mobility with Dr. Joe Weller and Lynn Cremando. Dr. Joe is a physical therapist currently treating patients at Elite Health Services in Old Greenwich, Connecticut. And in his work, he does a lot of innovative uh, work incorporating manual therapy, movement analysis, neuromuscular re-education and strength training to provide the broadest range of care um, available and to treat not just the part of the body where the pain is, but the whole body that, um, because usually the whole body is involved when there is a specific issue. Uh, Lynn Cremandos, um, most of you will be familiar with her. She serves as the lead trainer for UU Online's uh, wellness yoga certification programs. And she is a yoga teacher, yoga therapist, a board certified health and wellness coach, certified personal trainer, and Butaiko practitioner. And Lynn, I believe that is only like about half of your trainings that I'm listing. <laughs> So welcome both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. One more question. So you two have formed a very innovative and pioneering uh, partnership, uh, working on integrating advanced techniques from physical therapy and manual therapy and neuromuscular re-education uh, with the ancient techniques of yoga. And what has us particularly excited here at Yoga U Online is how you are using this knowledge to forge new pathways in our understanding of how we can work with the body, uh, particularly when it comes with overcoming limitations in our range of motion and our flexibility and our mobility. And a lot of people come to yoga because they want to increase their flexibility, as you know, but as most people discover, it's really not that easy to increase our flexibility, you know, just by doing static stretching. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you focus on is on integrating advanced stretching techniques into our yoga practice to make greater gains, gains in our mobility um, and range of motion. Could you talk of all, talk first of all about you know, how did you get started with this work? What inspired you to take this dive into with what, which is essentially a new territory, the integration of yoga with advanced techniques in uh, manual therapy and stretching? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to talk about what kind of therapy Joe does, because that is really the key. Um, I, as you know, Eva, am a therapy uh frequent flyer from an accident that I had 20 years ago that left my body pretty broken. And in my experience, when you go to traditional physical therapy, they have a prescription. Joe will correct me if I'm wrong, but in my experience, you get six, you're going to get six sessions. You, you broke your shoulder. It's six sessions in the shoulder. And for me, my body was like broken. And I had years and years of other things going wrong because my initial therapy only centered on my initial product problem so here it is 20 years later i meet up with joe and i find out there's literally nothing that you can't say to joe this is bothering me and he wouldn't say oh try this and it's in an area that is a completely different area of the body so when we started uh i i went to him first to kind of help me with some issues around my jaw and i thought this is like the people who go to uh get a contractor into their house and they do such a good job with the cabinets. They say, well, you come look at my bathroom and, oh, what about, I, I, I got some stairs in the basement. I want you to look at, um, I just start going, what else can you do? And I had started showing him things that I was taking techniques he was using and translating them into yoga. And my students were doing really well with it. So, so we started talking about what if we, actually did something with this. But I think it would be really interesting to hear from Joe about the therapy that you do, because it isn't 
you know, your grandmother's physical therapy. His so grandmother is in the other room, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it's, um, the reason why I became a physical therapist was not to treat the way that most physical therapists do, the way that Lynn described. Um, but it, really looking at, you know, you treat somebody that has a shoulder issue and maybe it's not from a broken bone or from a traumatic event, but like a chronic issue. And you would treat the shoulder, they get better after a few visits and they come back in after they go back to their sport and you never got down to the root cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. So to me, a lot of chronic injuries don't always come from where the dysfunction is that's causing the injury. It's more of a breakdown in the kinetic chain of compensation patterns. So let's say you have a really hip, uh, really stiff hip. If that hip is really stiff, you're not gonna feel pain in your hip as much you might feel it in your low back first because that hip is not moving out of its comfort zone. The back is the one that has to take up the load and use more range of motion, more muscle activity, uh, more strain on the discs, more strain on the nerve roots, the facet joints in order to complete that motion. So it's really, once I started doing some work through the Institute of Physical Art um, and training on watching how different parts of the body integrate and function together, that gave me a really good sense of kind of playing detective how do you find the root cause of the problem? And if you treat the hip and that issue keeps coming back, there's a lot of recidivism in it. You have to look outside the box. So mm -hmm. I usually tell my patients, if I try a treatment for one or two times and they're not getting results that I would expect, I'm looking to a different part of their body. Mm -hmm. And we, we track down injuries that can start in the knee, could be something from a shoulder issue for someone that's like a baseball pitcher. You know, if you don't have enough range of motion in one part of your body, other parts are gonna to have to compensate. And the ones that are taking the load that they're not used to or built to take are the ones that you're gonna see that deterioration, that breakdown, that discomfort, stiffness, pain first. Yeah, yeah. So that goes so well with what we're working on lately with fascial chains in yoga and, and, and functional change and how we are trying to, particularly at Yoga U, how we are trying to work with aging bodies and functional lines, mm -hmm. this kind of therapeutic approach brought into a non-therapeutic environment seemed like a really beautiful combination. Yeah, and it's such a fascinating uh, area. Be um, you know, I live in an aging body, <laughs> as do most of us. And uh, it is a very interesting to think to see that, you know, even with a yoga practice, your joints start to lose some degree of mobility uh, and you have to invest more and more time every day to stay even. Um, and I'm sort of curious about what is causing this because I don't think I necessarily have arthritis, but I just have this progressive stiffness. So what is causing us to lose range of motion flexibility and uh, mobility over time? Is it muscle tension patterns in the body? And those are the ones that you go hunting for when you are treating people? Yeah, it, it all depends on where the stiffness is and some areas like for me, it's, it's easy, you're said and done for somebody that's like a yoga instructor, because I get the opportunity to physically test the range of motion, the stiffness of the joint, the integrity of the body for each segment. All of our sessions are an hour one-on-one. -on -one, so I can look at almost everything that I need to within one or two sessions to say, this is why your body's getting stiffer. It's usually because there's some stiffness in your body that's making other areas work harder than they should. That's almost always what it comes down to whether that stiffness is in the thoracic spine and you have a little bit more of a kyphosis, a little bit more of like a, a hump going forward, that's going to cause your forward head posture and your extension in your neck. That's where your neck pain will likely come from. Um, uh, a back injury that is resolved but still has some dysfunctions in motion and movement can also cause the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it really all depends on doing a good deep dive. And I think that's what's great about the course that Lyd and I did and the, and the one previously, that you can use a lot of the techniques that we have shown you in these two courses to do a self-assessment and see 
where are your mobility restrictions and what points of your body and wherever your largest, most significant restrictions are, those are the ones that I would take care of first. They're such low hanging fruit. Reintegrate those into your yoga practice or do some of them outside of your yoga practice so that now you can focus on your main restrictions. But you can't focus on them until you actually search for them and find them. Right, so. right. So, so many of these techniques, Eva, I just want to add to what he said. With so many of these techniques, the test is also the exercise. The test Interesting. of the assessment is also the way to get out of it. But yeah. I was hoping to, not to cut you off, but I wanted to have Joe speak a little bit further because in yoga, we often think no matter what, it's a muscle. You know, no matter what the dish, which muscle is the problem here? And it's not always a muscle, right? It's, there's all kinds of other things that could be going wrong, which yeah. is one of the things you are looking at. I mean, as you age, there's going to be a generic stiffness that occurs in some of the joints. Your body's not going to be as fluid. The joint spaces might stiffen up a little bit. There might be some arthritis, which is going to increase inflammation. So as we get older, it's inevitable that you're not going to be a spry young chicken like you were when you were 13 and then when you go into 83. You know, they're two different bodies. You can't expect the same thing. It's just not fair. Yeah. Um, but making sure that you understand that not every restriction is a muscle. You know, you can't, you can't stretch out every restriction in your body. There's a lot of restrictions, especially when you get into the spine, unless you mobilize and treat the spine, you're always going to have some of those muscular tightnesses because the joint can open up. For instance, for the hamstring, if you always have this hamstring tightness, you know, make sure before you do a straight leg raise, maybe it's tightness and stiffness in the hip joint itself. And that's what's causing the ability for you not to come and bring your leg fully up. If your leg doesn't go through that full range of motion frequently, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it then that muscle need, never needs to be fully stretched out. So just like a rubber band, if you don't bring it through its full range of motion, you know, once a day, after a while, it's going to shorten and shorten and shorten until when you try to stretch it to where it used to be able to go, that's where you get an injury. That's where you get a muscle tendonitis, tear, things like that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it can be super frustrating for people. I mean, I think of my yoga students with tight hamstrings and you bring them into Supta Parangustasana on the floor um, with a belt around their foot and lift their leg. And the leg is like barely at a 30 degree, right? And they struggle just to hold the leg up and it's not budging. <laughs> so for those yoga students of mine that I felt great compassion for but were unable to help because the tissue just did not give mm -hmm. what do you recommend how have you you know how are you addressing that in your work with these advanced stretching techniques you're working on yeah so my first thing would be there's we get into it a little bit in the first lecture just knowing the difference between it's really easy to see in hamstring tightness but uh, neural tension, neural tightness versus muscular tightness, muscular tension. You know, there could be someone whose hamstring won't lengthen fully and their hip won't go into full flexion with a straight knee um, because the nerve doesn't like it. You know, you're putting too much tension on the sciatic nerve. It doesn't want to lengthen. So it'll re like reflexively spasm and shorten. That's one of the one common thing that will happen. And, and you can look it up with a, with a slump test, like a seated slump test and a seated extension test. That'll give you a good idea of what is causing that tightness. Is it true hamstring tightness or is it something more of like a neuroreflexive spasm that you're having and your body doesn't want to go there? Uh, my first recommendation, obviously I'm a little bit biased, is if you have a limitation in your body, go see a local physical therapist that you trust. Um, go get a true analysis so you know what to work on. Mm -hmm. I always show the better I treat my patients, the less I see them. You know, my goal is to show you guys where the restriction is, help you manually however I can, but then give you the tools to go run and play. You know, I want you guys to be able to have all these different techniques, put them in your little toolbox, and then use your self-assessment to say, okay, what tool do I need to whip out to fix this problem? Right, right. 
So, of course, you mentioned a lot of interesting stuff there, like the difference between muscular tension and neural tension and the slump technique. So now you're going to have to give us details and give us an example of the slump technique, because I can tell in my little ear that people are saying, <laughs> well, what is the slump technique? How do I do that to yeah. test the hamstrings? Yeah. So, um... Let me see if there's a way that I can do this here. Give me one second. All right. I'm going to put spotlight on you so we can see you. That's fine. <laughs> so one thing that you can do here, and sorry for all the vegetables in the background. One thing that you can do here is you sit upright, arms across the chest, slump down with pretty crappy posture. Then what you're going to do is tuck your head down towards your chest. And you're going to slowly straighten your leg. Once you feel any tightness in the back of your hamstring, anywhere from pretty much your, your glute, hamstring, calf, into the foot, you're going to stop there. Then what you're going to do is you're going to look all the way up. Note, when you look up, does that make the tension better or worse? Does it change it at all? Then you're going to look all the way down and point your foot up towards you. Does that increase the tension? Yes or no? So what you're looking for is if your slump, when you slump down, if you change your head posture, so if you're slumped down with your head down, and then you just you look up, if that takes tension off of your hamstring, off of your lower extremity, or off of your low back pain, mm -hmm. that is not necessarily hamstring tightness. You know, your hamstrings don't attach to your head. So your head motion, if it was a muscular issue, mm -hmm. should not change any of the tension that you feel in your lower extremities. Interesting. So though that's how you can tweeze out. Is it more hamstring tension or neural tension? It's really so, interesting. So if you straighten that leg and then you bring your head up and down and that has no effect on the tension in your leg, that's hamstring tension. You know, if, if you can put tension onto the nervous system, tension onto the spinal cord, when you look down, that's a dural stretch. You're putting, you're putting more of an elongation onto the neural structures down the spinal cord and then peripheral nerves as well. If that motion has no effect on the length or the tension that you feel in your leg, it's yeah. probably more muscular issue. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you're also moving the fascia when you move the head. You're kind of pulling on the fascia as well you're pulling a little bit on the fascia but you'll feel you shouldn't feel that sensation in the sciatic nerve distribution and you can try it on both sides mm -hmm. so if you do it on the right side versus the left side where you're having your symptoms or you're not having your symptoms no you'll feel something different yeah yeah very interesting yeah, yeah. there's a better demo of that in our uh in our upcoming course <laughs> Was that a demo of that in the course that we're our, the next course we're doing? So excellent, excellent. <laughs> yes. So so do let's take a dive into the course that you have created that is coming up soon uh, because now you got me super excited. I want to go sign up. <laughs> kind of a companion. We did one for the lower chain that was hip to to foot mm -hmm. with with the lumbar spine and you know kind of the spine and we thought well let's do it from the hips up um so it's interesting because mobility training encompass encompasses so much more than just stretching and a lot of what joe does is results in you getting more mobility in your shoulder flexion increasing. However, you haven't done any stretching at all. There isn't any sense in the traditional sense. And I think even in the fitness industry, as you know, where I hang out, they think of static stretching as a corrective technique that you use only when you need to, you know, one thing is shorter than the other and you want to stretch it. But this kind of resilience that you can bring into muscle fibers is completely different from what I learned, you know, low those many years ago 
where we were trying to sit with our legs wide on the floor and put our nose on the floor and toward what end, I don't know, other than severe arthritis, you know, on the low back. But um, <laughs> so, so what Joe does is he comes up with these, or, or he has all these techniques. And what I do is I look for ways to weave them into a yoga practice. So you could put a bunch of them together and make a yoga practice, or as a yoga teacher, you could take one. This is how I do them. I'll pick one thing. I'll pick one of these techniques and I'll put it into a bigger class. And everybody comes out with better posture because these, every one of these techniques, even though we're not addressing posture, gives you better posture, every one of them. Do you agree, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we just, and what we did in the course was, Joe goes into detail about as a therapist, how he would show you this is how you do it. But in the practice that we made, it's a yoga, it's, it's, it's in a yoga practice. So you, so you have a breakdown in the lectures of what we're doing and what the structures are. And then in the practice, we've just taken them out of that kind of clinical setting and put them into a practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are you using uh, specific um, muscle energy techniques, stretching techniques? Yeah, we're using uh, PNF for some of the techniques, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, mm -hmm. which is almost like a cool trick on the nervous system to help let a muscle reflexively relax and lengthen by that. Right. Um, so it's it's using, we get into it a little bit more in the lectures, but it's using different types of muscle contractions in different positions and with muscles on opposing point, parts of it and sides of a joint mm -hmm. to target some of the proprioceptive principles that are in the muscle tendon and the muscular tendinous junctions to help allow those muscles to relax and let go. Right. Similar to some of those reflexes that you get at the doctor's office when you get your annual physical, you know, right. there's a reflex that you use for the kneecap, one for the Achilles, one for the patella and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, using the same principles, but instead of trying to elicit a quick contraction, we're trying to elicit a relaxation. Right, right. I should, Joe, you should also touch on because after that, there's a neuromuscular re education that is the piece I think in yoga we miss a lot. If you just hold a pose mm -hmm. and go into another pose, your body could forget. Yeah. So it's, there's an old mentor of mine that would always joke and say, never pay for the same real estate twice. You know, and those are the people that if you stretch your hamstrings, but then don't use that new range of motion that you gained. It's going to tighten it up again because the body doesn't know what to do with it. You know, so if, if you've ever gained any range of motion, you need to immediately in that second retrain that motion into your nervous system, into your movement patterns, or else you're going to, it's going to tighten it up again. So your body will be, oh, like I, I've never been here before. This is vulnerable. I'm going to tighten up because I don't want to get hurt because I don't know what to do here. Mm -hmm. um, so slowly moving in and out of your end ranges is, 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 I think, the best way to start to improve some of the neuromuscular function, help improve more neuromoron or motor neuron recruitment. Um, so that way you have a more ingrained path and more likelihood to not have to stretch your hamstrings for the 10th day in a row without feeling like you've gained any mobility. Right, right. So it sounds like you're kind of redefining stretching as hacking both the nervous system and hacking the neuromuscular system, I guess yeah. essentially the neuromuscular system. Yeah. You got it. You have to, no system in the body works independently of the other. You know, right. so you, you have to look at the whole picture, just like a shoulder injury doesn't just affect the shoulder injury. You know, it right. can affect the cervical spine. It can affect the rib cage. It can affect your AC, SC joint. There's so many things. It can even affect your opposite hip. You know, because the body swings in opposite ways. Right arm moves forward, left leg moves forward. You know, there's so much reciprocity and connection in tensegrity for, in the body to function fully uh, mm -hmm. that you really, you have to treat it all. You can't just treat one thing. Right, right. Yeah. 
So cool. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time to create this course. I feel it's uh, incredibly valuable in information and even more so because no one else is doing this work, you know, and it's such an effective um, and innovative way to help us work with this um, you know, progressive loss of range of motion in the body, which, you know, let's face it, you know, if we don't work with it by the time we get to 80, 85, 90, we're, you know, all going to have lost so much range of motion that it really speeds up the, the yep. aging process. So it's Even really that, starting on ground the, zero. The mm. other cool thing is all the techniques that we use you would normally be doing those in Joe's office and no offense, Joe, but paying him a bunch of money. <laughs> but well worth it. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, we figured out how to use props or the wall or, a, you know, something else. Right. In the place of the therapist. So it does take it out of the therapeutic range. Right. But these are techniques you would normally need a second person to get your body into and help you do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Well, again, thank you so much, both of you. We can't wait for the course. And thanks so much for taking the time to join us today uh, to talk about the course and let us know what to expect. And everyone listening in, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you at your next course at Yoga You Online. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.